Should you remove bees from your garden to enjoy your space more? Well, the short answer is no. That's probably quite clear from the national collective conversation about conserving bees, which has recently made its way onto BBC Radio's Big Bee Challenge. However, it's the long answer that gets a bit more controversial and a bit more interesting. For example, every person has a slightly different situation. And if you're a retiree who's just sitting, enjoying watching your garden, you're going to have a very different answer to a parent of a child who's got very severe allergies to bee stings. In this video, I want to explore exactly what we're talking about when we refer to bees, how bees can actually benefit us, and also how we can learn to enjoy our space with them alongside us. Hello guys, I'm Emily Legg and with Ferroforus I create videos and blog posts about UK wildlife and wildlife friendly actions that we can take to help conserve it. If that's something that interests you, make sure to click subscribe below to make sure that you don't miss any future videos. I've recently moved house, so I've got this nice new filming space and I'm also currently in isolation, which means that I've got plenty of time to be filming some videos. If you've taken on any wildlife related challenges while you've been stuck in different isolations or lockdowns, comment below to let me know what you've been up to. To start this video off, we're going to talk about exactly what the word bee is referring to. Most people think that a bee is actually a single species, whereas in reality, there's over 20,000 species of bee worldwide, and they're all just categorized into this one group classed as bee. In the UK, there's over 270 bee species, and most of these aren't what you typically picture when you think of a bee. Let's start with the honeybee, which despite being well known about, is not actually usually considered native in the UK. There's between seven and 12 species of honeybee worldwide, and it, when you're in the UK, usually it would be the Western honeybee or Apis mellifera that you'd be seeing. Archaeological records of honeybees in the UK show a lot of association with human settlements. So it's believed that the honeybees were actually brought over here. Even if they were originally native to the UK, the honeybees that we currently have here have been so thoroughly domesticated that they're very far removed from what our native honeybees would originally have been like. In fact, in reading about the honeybees, I've come to realise that in the research, there's not actually a lot known about the differences between wild and domestic honeybees. And so we don't actually know to what degree any wild honeybees could potentially be under threat. Honeybees are fairly recognisable because most people can see their distinctive black and gold stripes and their bent antennae and know what they are. Most of the time you'll see a few of them foraging around plants together, but sometimes they'll form much larger clusters called swarms and these can look a lot more intimidating. However, these swarms are actually only a new hive of bees trying to establish themselves somewhere new and usually they're just resting, draped over a car or on the side of a building, and they'll move on within a day or two without you needing to intervene. Unfortunately, because they're quite a domesticated species, most of these honeybee swarms won't actually survive without human intervention. So if you do see one, it can be a good idea to call your local beekeeper, and usually they'll come down, gather up the swarm, and take it to a more suitable place where humans can manage them. Next, let's look at bumblebees, which are also commonly pictured when the word bee is brought up. There are many more bumblebee species than honeybees, with 250 bumblebee species worldwide and 25 of those living within the UK. Bumblebees are also social bees, although they form much smaller colonies than honeybees do. The colonies are made up of a female queen and all of her offspring, and they have a really interesting family structure, very similar to an ant's, which I can cover in much more detail in a future video if that's something that would interest you. These colonies start around February time, when a new queen emerges freshly from the soil and starts looking for a nesting site. She'll find a site in some underground area or in some dense grass and start to have her offspring. The workers will then forage through the summer, helping build up the colony until finally the female will have male and female offspring that go off to mate to start new hives. In around the autumn time, that's when most of the hive will start to die off and it's actually only those newly mated female queens that will survive by burying themselves underground and hibernating over the winter. Then come spring again, they'll start emerging and the cycle will start all over again. Now, interestingly, in the winter time in recent years, 
some queens have been staying out and actually establishing new nests and having workers born over the winter. So sometimes you will now see, particularly in the south of England, in urban areas, some bumblebees foraging around during the colder months. Although their large size can make them look intimidating, most bumblebees aren't actually aggressive and if you leave them alone, they tend to leave you alone. So you don't need to worry if you do see them in your garden. Now you will sometimes see tree bumblebees which make their homes in places like birds boxes or in crevices in buildings. These bees have a much higher level of activity and they can often be seen flying around circling surveillance around their nest sites and creating a lot of noise with their buzzing. Now these can be a little bit scary but again they tend to be okay if you just keep your distance away from them and leave them alone. This high level of activity tends to coincide with when their hive is naturally about to die off in a few weeks time. So just leave them be and naturally let them complete their life cycle. Finally, we come on to the solitary bee group, which makes up the majority of bee populations both in the UK and worldwide. Here in the UK, we actually have over 240 species of solitary bees, and as their name suggests, they tend to live on their own rather than in colonies. There are so many of them that they actually have lots of different life history strategies with varying things such as where they choose to nest and which flowers they choose to forage on. However, with all of these differences, they do have one big thing in common, which is that combined they make up the majority of the pollination that happens in the UK and a lot of our gardens and also our farmlands are reliant on their pollination. Most solitary bees in the UK will nest in the soil. The female will find a suitable spot, dig down to make a chamber herself, then she'll put down some pollen, moisten it with some nectar and lay her egg before sealing up the chamber with some of the mud. She'll then back out to create a new chamber for her next egg. Our 65 species of mining bees are our largest bee group in the UK and they all nest in this way down in the soil. Most of our five species of flower bees and our 40 species of sweat bees also nest in the soil. Other species of solitary bee will make use of aerial spaces to nest in, such as old beetle holes or bramble stems. They use th various things to seal up their nests, such as saliva-like substances, mud, chewed up leaves or resin. These tend to be the species that you'll find within your bee hotels. So if you've got a bee hotel installed in your garden, make sure to keep an eye out for the aerial nesting solitary bee species. Some examples include our 11 species of yellow-faced bees, or you could see the bee Ceratina cyanae, which both nests and hibernates within bramble stems. You could even see seven of our leafcutter species, which nest in beetle holes, and they can also use up to 40 different pieces of leaf per egg to make sure that they're nice and safely sealed up. Our 11 mason bee species are solitary bees that all have very different life history strategies. Some will nest in places like snail shells, whereas others will nest in different plant stems. They'll also vary how specialised they are on their food sources. So some mason bee species will specialise on only a single plant, whereas others will be able to feed from a wide variety of different plants. Finally, we've got a group that makes up a quarter of UK solitary bees, which are our brood parasites. Now brood parasites are called this because they parasitise on other bee species broods. They can't actually collect their own pollen, so they rely on these other species to collect the pollen for them and feed their offspring. What they'll do is invade an already created nest and lay their own egg in there. And then either they will kill that egg of the other species that originally laid and made the nest, or their young will do it once they've hatched out by either killing it directly or by starving it by eating the pollen for themselves. Now this species can be a lot rarer than the species that they rely on and they also tend to be quite specialised towards the plants that that species specialises on to make sure that they are in tune with the life cycle and able to lay their eggs at the same time as the original species. There's a couple of reasons you might be a bit unsure about having solitary bees nesting in your garden. For one, even though they're a solitary species, if your garden's a really, really good nesting ground, you might find many of them clustering together to create different individual nests in the same location. You might also find a few species create little turrets in the soil, which can be quite distinctive features within your garden. They could also be burrowing into some soft brick mortar within different buildings to create their nests that way instead. 
Now with that said, they don't often cause very much structural damage at all and it's quite rare to find them gathering in large numbers. So in reality, these don't really tend to be problems within a garden. Another issue is that they quite often get misidentified for other species, such as wasps, hornets, hoverflies or bee flies. A way to solve this is to learn how to identify different bee species so that you can tell that you've actually got solitary bees and not these other species that you might be a bit more fearful of. Or you could learn about these different species and realise that actually some of the other species that you might be scared of also cause good benefits and don't need to be such a thing to be feared of. In the last hundred years we've lost some of our bee species and many more are becoming closer and closer to that threat of extinction. This is really sad both for the bee species themselves and our diversity of life in the UK as well as for the ecosystems they help and the plants and the different farmland crops that they help to continue survival of. The way that bees do this is by foraging around on different flowers and when they do this they pick up pollen that attaches to them and then when they go on to the next flowers some of this pollen comes off and helps the plants reproduce. Now this is a really in-depth process called pollination which I can cover more detail in another video if you are interested in that one as well. But for now it's best just to know that when bees are foraging around they're actually helping continue the survival of a lot of plant species within the UK. Now I hope in this video by learning about how varied different bee species are, how interesting their adaptations to our environment can be and how important they are for the pollination of our wildflowers and also our farmland crops, you've become a little bit more interested in helping conserve our bee species. But how can we actually learn to live in peace with bees and share our space with them? Well we can't really cover learning to live with bees without covering the other side of things as well. Very occasionally there will be a case where bees have nested in somewhere that's really problematic to humans. In this case usually calling a local beekeeper will help because they'll be able to advise you with what to do and they'll also sometimes come down and move the nest for you. If this can't be done because the nest is located in a really difficult to reach place or it's a really problematic nest, then the last resort option is to eradicate the nest. If you've had to have this process done, please make sure that afterwards you're covering up any access points for future bees. That way we can keep down how many casualties of bees there are by not allowing them even the option to nest in that area that you don't want them in. If you are doing this, please make sure that you do provide other spaces where bees can nest, such as bee hotels or providing a space of long grassy area within your garden. This way, future queens looking for suitable nesting spots will find a nice area that you've set aside for them rather than nesting in a problem area. With that said, the best way to actually enjoy sharing your space with bees is to follow these four simple steps. Firstly, keep your distance from the bees. Although bees are usually not aggressive, by keeping your distance from them, you're reducing the likelihood that they're going to see you as a threat and then you can both enjoy using the space at the same time. On warmer days, you need to remember not to panic when you see the bees flying around really rapidly. If this is happening and they're going around the garden really fast, they're not going to be chasing you. They're actually just enjoying the warm weather and the energy boost to be able to get more food from the plants while they still can. Remember also to actually enjoy watching the bees. Take some time to try and identify some of the species that are being attracted in your local area and you can also try and figure out why they're behaving in certain ways and see whether there are actually any bees that are specialising on some of the plants that you have in your garden. Finally, try and educate your friends and families about why you're trying to help the bees. So this could be something like teaching them about how the, they act as pollinators and can really benefit plants which includes all of the flowers in your garden as well as all of the farmlands growing crops that we need to eat. You can also educate them about how bees will only sting when it's an absolute last resort if they're feeling really threatened. So the stinger on a bee is actually a modified ovipositor which is how a female lays her eggs. So therefore it's only females that are actually able to sting, not the male bees. And these females will only sting when they're threatened, so if you're handling them roughly or if you're trading on them, those sorts of actions. They don't really want to sting and in the case of a honeybee, if they do sting, because our skin is so thick compared to their stinger, it will actually snap off and then the honeybee will die. So this won't happen for a bumblebee or a solitary bee and these species are able to sting multiple times, 
but again, they're not aggressive and they don't really want to. So just remember that if you're relaxing in your garden, not doing anything, minding your own business, even if a bee was to land on you, it's got no reason to actually try and sting you. So as you hopefully understand now, removing bees isn't such a good idea for your garden. In fact, quite the opposite. By removing bees, you're actually reducing how much pollination can take place in the local environment, and so harming local wild plants as well as local farming crops. You also don't have much of a point to removing local bees because bees don't tend to be aggressive and they also don't tend to come up together very often in large spaces and block up areas of your garden. In fact, it can be quite exciting to sit back and have the bees buzzing around in your garden because you can learn to identify all of our 270 species and you can learn what their different behaviours as they're going around the garden actually mean. Let me know in the comments if you've actually been watching any bees recently and if you've seen any interesting behaviours yourself. And if you're interested in learning even more about some of our other misunderstood species, I have this recent video that I produced about UK bats that you can go on to watch.